Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. We're going to take a look at solving challenging network problems in the workplace. It's really helpful for the IT pro to understand that when you roll out your network, you are running out an electrical system. It is therefore impacted by electrical problems. Case in point, the limits of unshielded twisted pair copper. If you work in a pretty safe environment where you just have businesses and offices, unshielded twisted pair is great and it's cost effective. But the minute I take that unshielded twisted pair and I take it to a Coca-Cola bottling company where I've got motors and generators and three-phase power, your network's going to go down. Networks are impacted by electrical noise. It's really helpful to understand the source of that noise and what can we do about it. Many IT pros run networks in very hostile environments. Extreme heat, extreme cold, water, moisture, petroleum products. If you work for a government agency, you could be impacted by electronic eavesdropping. It's very important to understand the sources of electromagnetic interference, which is very different than radio frequency interference. For example, in a data center, they have thousands of servers. Those are gigantic RF generators, and they create lots of interference. In an industrial environment where you've got very large motors, three-phase power, those create EMI, or electromagnetic interference. Most of us in a business environment do not use shielded twisted pair, but it's a great solution for many of these problems. We're going to understand shielded twisted pair and look at the six types of STP cable. Because we're running out these electrical systems known as our Ethernet network, they are subject to things like electrical ground loops. We're going to learn the importance of galvanic isolation, which if we didn't have, you couldn't run your network two feet. We're also going to look at how we can use fiber to solve many of these electrical problems that face Ethernet. We're going to look at optical media converters, especially those with PoE and things that you need to pay real close attention before you buy that media converter. We're also going to look at how to choose optical transceivers as you move to fiber. Now, one of the limitations of unshielded twisted pair is the distant limitation, 100 meters. Now, you can run up to 5 gig on 100 meter CAT6 and CAT7. You can run 5 gig, 2.5, and 1 gig on those cable links. But the minute you go to 10 gigs, immediately the length of the cable has to be reduced. As you move to CAT8 and you're running 25 and 40 gigs, you're down to 30 meters. Engineers have designed a lot of very powerful technology in Ethernet to prevent it from being impacted by electrical noise. But let's understand where electrical noise comes and what can we do to reduce it. Unshielded twisted pair is also susceptible to interference from electromagnetic and radio frequency. Now to better understand what RFI is, I have a radio right here and I have it detuned. What that means is I don't have it on a station. You can hear that that was on a radio station, but I've deliberately detuned it. I've pulled it away from a selected radio station and you can hear the noise, just the RF noise that the antenna picks up. What I'm going to do is show you RFI interference. And I'm actually going to do that by opening up my Chromebook. And I want you to listen to the change of noise that this radio is going to pick up when I turn on my Chromebook. So I'm just going to lift the lid. Hear that change of noise? That's because my Chromebook is turning on and is generating RF noise. 
You can hear the different noise that's happening on the radio. I'm going to shut my laptop and it's going to go off. And we're going to go back to that steady RF noise that we heard before. This laptop is a Chromebook and it will generate RFI. Radio frequency is just one of many electrical problems facing your network. If you notice the photo on the right, you see these round circular items that snap around cables because long cables act like antennas. They pick up RF energy. So when you have a USB cable or a monitor cable or an HDMI cable or any kind of cable, it acts like an antenna and is ideal for picking up RF interference. These actually choke them or suppress them from entering your equipment or if a designer has done a bad job, it also suppresses it from leaving the equipment. Unshielded twisted pair cable is susceptible to a variety of electrical noise problems. We're going to look at the source of those noise problems, and they are five. Far-end reflection, near-end reflection, near-end crosstalk, which is known as NEX, far-end crosstalk, which is known as FEX, and alien crosstalk. So when I talk about near-end reflection and far-end reflection, what am I talking about? Anytime I transmit electrical energy and somewhere down the line, some of that energy reflects back into the transmitter. You say, what does that mean in terms of IT pros? If my network card is transmitting a frame to the switch port and somewhere down in the cable, some of that energy is reflected back into the network card, it's going to impact the quality of the signal. It may even corrupt it. So the difference between far end reflection and near end reflection is simple. One is further down in the cable, one is closer to the transmitter or your network card or your switch port. The most common causes for reflection is RJ45 connectors, jacks, patch panels, either poor quality or improper installation. Another contributor to reflection is a bent cable or a kinked cable. Cables that look like this are a disaster. For now the next type of noise in cables is abbreviated NEXT and FEX, but basically it's crosstalk. You can see in the picture below, I've got two pairs of wires inducing signal into the bottom pair of wires. If the induction of energy is close to the transmitter, it's NEXT. If the induction of the signal is further down the cable, it's called FEXT. Now the result of both NEXT and FEXT, which is crosstalk, is that it produces a smaller attenuated signal. Now the last electrical noise issue with cables is alien crosstalk. And this is typically when they bundle cables together with zip ties and they stress the cables or deform the structure of the cable, causing one cable to induce voltage into another cable. A good competent team of cable installers is worth their weight in gold. People that know what they're doing and can properly install, even if that bid for that job is higher, it's worth getting that team. Remember, cheap equals problems. Cable installation is very important in, in the installation of structured cable, but so is quality components. So if your patch panels, your cables, all of the connectors, jacks, plugs involved in the, the cable structure, if they're not all good quality components, you're gonna have problems. Now, Shielded Twisted Pair actually addresses a lot of the electrical noise problems that we just talked about. Notice this particular version or form of STP. It's known as FOIL forward slash FOIL Twisted Pair or F forward slash FTP. Notice you have FOIL wrapped around each Twisted Pair, which eliminates crosstalk completely. Then you have FOIL around all of the twisted pairs, which eliminates RFI and EMI. So this design with shielded twisted pair really is a step up in eliminating a lot of these electrical noise issues. Now shielded twisted pair comes in the six variations that are shown on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of them because I'm going to walk you through some of them. They're more expensive in purchasing the cable and they're also more difficult to install and needs a competent group of installers. This is SF forward slash UTP. The pairs are unshielded, but notice we have foil and we have braid. Braid gives you the greatest amount of strength. The foil wrapped around the unshielded twisted pair gives you the high rejection from EMI, RFI. 
This version is F forward slash FTP, so you have foil around each pair, extremely high crosstalk rejection, plus you got foil around the entire four pairs, which gives you great EFI, RFI, EMI rejection. You do have to have installers that understand shielded twisted pair to properly install your system. Notice that many of these shielded twisted pairs come with a drain wire. You can see it coming out. Those are used so you can effectively get a signal ground. So these are variations of Cat8 Jackson plugs and notice how they are even shielded. Ethernet runs in many hostile environments where you have water, moisture, RFI, EMI, dust, oil, chemicals, vibration, temperature extremes. Industrial Ethernet uses special cables that can withstand all those extreme items that we just talked about, plus special connectors, push and lock, vibration insensitive, waterproof, designed for extreme temperature. Many industrial Ethernets use unique protocols as shown in the list below. When you buy industrial ethernet cables, they usually test for cold bend, cut through, water immersion, crushing, UV exposure, abrasion, oil resistance, cold impact, high temperature. They're not your typical cables that we put in our cozy, cushy little offices. Now, one of the protocols used by industrial ethernet is called real-time profinet, and it basically eliminates TCP IP in entirely, yet it's totally compatible with normal ethernet. It allows their application to get performances up to 1 to 10 milliseconds. Now, STP is used by the U.S. government. Sensitive government agencies are required to use either STP or fiber. They are required to meet a requirement called Tempest, and it's to keep all their data secure. This avoids RF jamming and avoids eavesdropping. STP is also required by many medical equipment and medical facilities. So what are devices that generate EMI and RFI? Remember, EMI is typically lower frequency. Very often it's 60 cycle. So a big motor that is running would generate a lot of EMI. So AC DC motors are typical generators of some RFI, lots of EMI, high voltage transmission lines. If you live in a neighborhood where you've got power transmission lines, you can talk to anybody that lives in that area and they will tell you that they experience EMI and RFI. Cooling compressors, fluorescent lights, welding. If you've got anybody that's welding in an area where you've got tremendous high current, you're going to get EMI. Electrical panels, if they're above 200 amps, which is typically what your home has. So any commercial installation of three-phase power is also a potential EMI RFI generator. Many data centers use STP cable because of the enormous amount of RFI generators called servers, storage devices that are in their building and it helps eliminate a lot of that unwanted induced voltage. When you're using in your security systems like cameras and alarm detection units, you're using unshielded twisted pair, criminals have found out that jammers can overwhelm the cable and literally block out any effort to detect a criminal break-in. Ethernet often has to get into very difficult locations. A lot of thought and a lot of engineering design goes into making Ethernet work in these type environments. Two additional electrical problems are electrical ground problems and electrical ground loop problem. If you have a friend who's a musician, especially those friends that are musicians and that have been in a band, talk to them about electrical ground problems and electrical ground loop problems. They can probably tell you some horror stories. All electronic equipment can be impacted by these two very, very important electrical problems. This is a picture of a network closet, an IDF, in one of the schools that I worked in. If you look at the very bottom of the picture, you'll see a copper bus bar, and you'll see a lot of ground cables coming down and attaching to that ground. That's an indication of a good electrical design for your network equipment. If you go in your network closets and you don't see good grounding, 
you are very open to a lot of electrical ground problems. So what is a ground loop? In the United States, our electrical outlet has a hot, a neutral, and a ground. When you plug these two computers into an electrical outlet in the United States, you ground the chassis of the computer to the ground in the AC outlet, electrical outlet. If I have one computer and its ground is zero volts, and I have another computer and its ground is 0.25 volts, not a lot of difference, and I connect, plug those two computers into those electrical outlets, and I connect a wire between them, especially a wire that connects them to ground. I will get what's known as a ground loop. I'll get unwanted current that flows from one electrical outlet through the two pieces of equipment to the other outlet. This is unwanted. This is called a ground loop. When you have this unwanted current, even though it's small, it can cause network equipment malfunction. Network equipment can be damaged by this current. If it's extreme, it can cause fire hazards. Electrical ground loops are important for every tech to understand the basics of. So does Ethernet cabling that connects computers between sometimes 80 meters of distance. And we know there's a great potential those two computers may have different ground voltages. So the potential of ground loops is very high. Do Ethernet cabling provide opportunity for ground loops? And the, the answer is no. The reason is electrical engineers well understood the potential of ground loops in an Ethernet system. So what they did was they added a component into Ethernet that saved the day. That component is called a transformer. Now a transformer is just like that picture on the right hand side. That's a transformer. Now look at my diagram below and you'll see active PHY. Think of that as my switch, my network card, my router, and all the electronics that run that device. And then over here I've got my Cat5 cable pair. Notice that in between those two, between one pair of Cat5 or Cat6 or Cat7 and my electronics of the device, network card, switch, I've got the transformer between the two. It isolates electrically the two apart. So anything on the cable will never touch the electronics in the network, never touch the electronics in your switch, will never touch the electronics in your router. Now electrical engineers call this galvanic isolation. It's used by shielded twisted pair, unshielded twisted pair. It's also used in the design of USB cables, firewire cables, HDMI cables. All of them provide the isolation between the cable and the electrical equipment that it connects to. This avoids ground loops. Now, if you'll look at the picture on your left, you'll see components that look like IC chips. Those are not IC chips, those are transformers. Ethernet protects humans as well as equipment. The standard for Ethernet cabling separates electronic equipment from the cabling. It has to be able to withstand over 1500 volts AC for up to a minute between hanging onto the cable and any fault in any piece of electronic equipment. Now, whenever you're faced with a distance problem with networks, especially when you have an IP camera that's being put 600 meters away from your nearest switchboard, then things like media converters can really be handy, especially if it's one or two items that you have to connect up to. PoE media converters are super handy because many IP cameras can be powered on by a single network cable. If you're going to use media converters to extend your LAN, choose them very wisely. This is an example of a very nice PoE media converter. It has a PoE budget of almost 30 watts. It has a one gigabit ethernet. It's plug and play. It supports small form factor optical transceivers, and it supports both single mode and multi-mode. This is a great media converter. Whenever you're buying a media converter with power over ethernet, make sure you look at the power brick. That power brick has to be able to support the PoE requirements of that media converter. So take a look at its DC voltage and its DC current and make sure that it can support the power that it says it can. If you have a media converter that supports both single mode fiber and multi mode fiber, if you need that distance a long way, then you want to choose single mode tra optical transceivers. If you're just going within 600 meters, you can do multi mode and get an multi mode optical transceiver. Remember, when it comes to determining type of optical transceiver that you're going to buy for your switch or for your media converter,
converter. You get out your manuals. Your equipment will tell you what kind of optical transceivers you can use. So Mr. Vanderpool, I have an HP switch or a Dell switch. Can I use a third-party transceiver? Do I have to buy a Dell optical transceiver? In all fairness, you can buy really good third-party transceivers that will work just fine with your network equipment. One thing I would do is make sure you read your equipment warranty policy so that you don't violate it by buying a third-party optical transceiver. Now, once you've read your manual and you know what kind of optical transceiver your switch or your optical converter will use, all you have to do is match the way wavelength, the speed type, and the correct fiber type. If you get those three things correct, you will have complete compatibility. Now, once you get your media converter, your fiber optics all sent to you, don't go and try to get it all installed. Tie wrapped, put a place for your media converter, and then spend two hours trying to make it work. Don't learn the hard way, like myself and so many IT pros. Take your equipment that you just got, go in your office, find a spare switch, get it all hooked up, connect it, make sure it works before you place it into its location. That's a tip from us that have to learn the hard way. One last tip about your optical media converters, try to find one that has what's called an LFP function, little switch in the back that allows you to pass an optical fault to your switch port so that you're aware of a potential problem. Remember, media converters come in all shapes and styles. If you're not familiar with transceivers, make sure that your transceiver goes into your switch port with a click and you have placed those transceivers firmly into their module port. Now here I have my switch software and I'm looking at my Aruba interface to my switch and I'm using port 25 for my transceiver. And you can see on my status, the transceiver is down, it's not working but it does recognize a transceiver. You can see the type, you can see the configuration mode and the mode, and you can look up at the top, port 25 statistics, and there's no traffic flowing on my optical transceiver. Now, once I have everything running, you can see the same port 25. Now the status or interface is up. It is all working. I can see I've got a, a gig full duplex and you can see all my traffic on my statistics. I can see that that thing is working. Now I'm ready to install.